as we are getting connected, I'm going to drop a link in the chat that I would like folks to participate in just to get a sense of where everyone is, is tuning in from uh, during this virtual summit today. So we have a Menti link and that's going to show us how, uh, how many zip codes or how many counties we have across Kentucky uh, represented here today, which I'm really excited to, to see the potential there. All right, we're getting, we're getting some answers in, quite a few from Jefferson, it looks like. And this is a word cloud, so the bigger the word, usually the more responses that are the same for that word. But I'm seeing Woodford, Warren, Whitley. I'm seeing east to west representation here, which is fantastic. Keep, keep, keep them coming. I'm gonna leave this up while we do a little bit of housekeeping and then we're going to jump into the day. So I'm Shannon Moody with Kentucky Youth Advocates. And Kentucky Youth Advocates is a nonprofit, nonpartisan advocacy organization whose mission is to make Kentucky the best place in America to be young. And we do that through a lot of different means. And, and one of those is, is creating opportunities for, um, for work in different spaces with the voices of folks who are impacted. In particular today, we're talking about kinship care uh, with the Kinship Families Coalition of Kentucky and several other experts from outside of our organization to give some insight on kind of where Kentucky sits around kinship care, both formal and informal. So we're talking about those who have some um, involvement with child welfare systems, but also ideally we're, we're going to hear a little bit about those who are not connected to the child welfare system in that informal setting as well. But we're going to hear a broad range of information today. It is a packed two and a half hours. So make sure that you're get up, you, you're moving around a little bit when there's an opportunity. If you're more comfortable with your camera off, it's okay to keep it off. If you're more comfortable with it on, we'd love to see your face, so please feel free to do that. Uh, we are recording today, and we will share the recording uh, through YouTube um, as a follow-up to this summit. We'd like to thank uh, United Healthcare for their generous sponsorship and making this a possibility today, as well as Casey Family Programs for their support in um, part two. And part two is coming up over the next couple of months where the Kinship Families Coalition of Kentucky is going to be working with support groups across the state to really dig in to what they are seeing on a local level as far as opportunities and continued challenges so that we can gather all that information and look for trends and then report it back to the fine folks who are um, on, on this um, panel and, and uh, within leadership today. So we are um, going to start with a short video from a, uh, a kinship care advocate who we've known since she was in high school. And uh, you'll get to hear a couple words from her and then we will jump into the program with Norma Hatfield after that. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Jesse, who will um, share that video from Katie and those opening remarks. We are so grateful that you're here. Welcome everyone to Kentucky Youth Advocates 2021 Kinship Summit. Thank you to kinship caregivers and advocates across the great state of Kentucky for attending today. I so wish that I could be there today with all of you to celebrate Kentucky children and families. My name is Katie Okumu and I'm from Berea, Kentucky in Madison County. I partnered with Kentucky Youth Advocates in 2016 and 2017 when I was a high school student to raise awareness and support for kinship families. My mother died when I was an infant. My father lived in Kenya across the Atlantic Ocean. My grandmother and my great-grandmother, Kathy and Ruby Farrell, stepped up to the plate. They raised my older brother and I like their own children. We called them Mommy Kathy and Grandma Ruby. Long after they had finished raising their own biological children, they were given two more. My family struggled financially, especially after my grandmother died. Our greatest champion, my great-grandmother was our guardian until she passed away at the age of 98. In high school, 
I recognized how challenging it was for my grandmother and my great grandmother to raise us and go underrecognized and undersupported. Kentucky Youth Advocates and their staff helped me find a voice. But most importantly, they helped me and they did the work of elevating the story of kinship families in Kentucky, families like my own. I was able to work on the First Ladies Youth Voice Council, raising awareness and advocating for support for kinship families in Kentucky. We met with legislators in Frankfurt and we talked openly and honestly about what was impacting kinship families, what it was like being in a kinship family. I want to share where I am now with you all because I wouldn't be here without my kinship family, every other kinship family in Kentucky, or Kentucky Youth Advocates. I'm a graduate of Harvard University with a degree in history and literature, and I just started a job teaching high school students United States history in Boston. I love my job, and I love my job because of my students. Like many of us here today, many of my students live with their grandmothers, their grandfathers, their aunts, their uncles. Many of my students are in foster care, adopted, or other family structures. KYA has made a lasting impact on my life and my dedication to being an advocate for students now that I'm an adult. Once again, I wish I was there with you to celebrate how far we've come and also to think about what else we can accomplish together. Important advancements in kinship care have been made in recent years, all thanks to the hard work of kinship families and their supporters. Both you and these advancements are worth celebrating. For example, there are new options for supports for relative caregivers with the addition of the Kentucky Relative Caregiver Program in 2020. There is a bigger focus within DCBS for access to supporters, and there's more collaboration overall. I would like to give a special shout out to Maurice Lee with DCBS and Sheila Renfro with UK College of Social Work who are at the Kitchen Summit today. Thank you for your work on education and awareness building related to supports for relative caregivers. And thank you for inviting me back. Have a wonderful summit. Bye. Thank you, Katie. Um, my name is Norma Hatfield and I am president of the Kinship Families Coalition of Kentucky. And I'm also a grandmother who's been raising two grandkids for the past seven years. Um, I have to tell you how much I appreciate all the groups that work together to make this summit happen today. This has been a dream for me for the past seven years that kinship families aren't a footnote at the bottom of a report or a slide. And so we have two, two and a half hours to talk about the fact we're here. The, the fact that, um, you know, we've come a long ways. The, the fact that we still need a lot more support and services because kids are still going into the system and they need their family. To me, this is not a token attempt to quickly say, we're here, we're important, but it's just another uh, step on the, on the ladder to get us to maybe where the possibilities can be uh, limit, uh, you know, limited, unlimited. Um, so I guess what I need to do at this point is just kind of step back for a moment um, with all the positive things about the summit and where we are and kind of just talk about where we've been. Because one of the things that I have found is that while kinship families are thrilled that things happen, um, you know, more positive things, it, they don't always feel like they're heard well, they, they may say, oh, you put something new in place, but that sure doesn't help me. Uh, I was caught in the gap between the old kinship program and the new foster, cut, foster care things. And so doesn't really help me much. Um, I have sat in too many forums where I've had great aunts, great grandmothers, grandfathers, siblings, cousins, and they have sat in a chair at a support group and cried. And there was fear, there was despair, there was a feeling of hopelessness. 
how am I going to take care of these kids? It's over and over. It's why doesn't somebody see what's going on? Why is this happening like it is? What am I going to do in 10 years from now? Because I've drained my 401k. I have maxed out my credit cards. I have lost my home. I have lost my car. What am I going to do in 10 years? I've had the conversations with a grandmother two weeks before Christmas, and she said, I think I'm going to have to send them back to DCBS because I don't have any more money. Um, I don't fit exactly the criteria within dollars of getting food stamps, within just dollars. Um, And so the kids still have to be fed. I I just don't know what to do. And and I'm going to tell you, I don't think anybody would disagree with this. No grandmother should ever have that on their minds that they're going to have to do this. Um, In 2013, we had an old kinship care program that paid $300 a month and that ended. And some of the things that I heard from folks um, was, well, they just dropped it out of the budget and moved on like things changed and nobody needed any assistance and these kids weren't in the system anymore. And we're still here. We're still waiting. We, we still have these kids that we have to take care of. Or in 2014, when my kids, grandkids went into the system um, and I met so many caregivers in our local support group and they would sit around the table with a cup of coffee and they would cry or they would shake their head and they would say, ain't going to change. I'm just trying to figure it out and get by day to day. And I hope that I live long enough to make sure everything is done and it's all in place, but I'm scared. I'm not going to have anything to leave them. I, I, there there is no options for college because I've drained every, every cent that I have. Um, I think when when we started the petition across the state of Kentucky and so many of you um, jumped in, and I know you were nervous about sharing your stories. That's one thing that I found. There was such a stigma and bias for caregivers to share what's really going on in their life and to say, I hate to say this, but I need help for my grandkids. Um, but so many people boldly stepped out and said, yes, I'm going to share my story. I'm going to say what's really happening out there. And collectively, that five to 6,000 of you that did that, those stories went to, you know, the Kentucky State Senate. And what, what, what I found is interesting was at the very, very beginning, there's a deafening silence. I don't think anybody understood really what kinship care was. I know that many, many legislators at that particular time did not really understand kinship care because they told me so. They just had the perspective that it was family taking care of family and they got it and we shouldn't have to worry about that. But there's so much more that's going on behind the scenes. So there was that deafening silence. But then over time, as our voices got louder and a little bit louder, we started hearing a rumble. Um, Do versus Glisten came out, which had been working along, you know, in parallel with with the petition and the things they've been working on. They that, that had been worked on for years, and all of a sudden, you know, the media came out and they're announcing that uh, kinship families are going to get foster care, um, foster care assistance, and all of that. And and there were there were many that did get some of that assistance, but there were so many that had shared their stories that were still waiting. And then we had Family First. And Family First brought more opportunities at the federal level and gave states more flexibility and they gave them more opportunities. And and Kentucky quickly jumped in and they they set up their DCBS service array and, and the legislature was talking more and more about what can we do? We've got to solve some of these problems. And it got really, really exciting. And that little bitty rumble started to grow. Now, we're not where we could be. Um, there are a lot of things that I feel 
still need to be done. There are a lot of things that many of you have shared with me that there, that need to be done. We still have families from the 2013 time frame when the old program ended and Family First and Deal versus Clisson happened. There's still a lot of families in there that wrote of despair and, and pleading for help and they're still waiting. And I want them to know they're not forgotten. We have other families that are out there and they're getting the services and the support they need. What I worry about is long-term. I worry about when their case closes and the foster pay assistance ends and they still have 10 more years of raising that child. I worry about that. I worry um, about KTAP and Kentucky Transitional Assistance Program and how many of you wrote and said, well, it's $186 for the first kid and I have five. And they said, just to get to the $300 threshold, it takes four kids. And oh, by the way, um, I haven't um, been able to keep it because there's a requirement that I have to worry about child support in the system. Well, why? That, it's, it's why do we put that on people that are doing the service that they're doing to put that on them as well? Let them focus on saving the kids, um, you know, helping them heal, providing what the resources that they need. Uh, very similar to what foster families do. They don't have to worry about that. Why do we have kinship families doing that? I think mean, that's conversations that, um, you know, the commissioner has been amazing. And I email her and she answers me back and she's been looking at KTAP and, and we're going to have more conversations. But, but these are the things, these are the cries that I hear from so many of you. Um, the, the dollar amount, from what I've been told, that 186 has been there since the 1990s. Where are we looking at inflation? How much does it really cost to raise the child? What are the needs that are there? These are all the things that I see amazing possibilities for um, and, and potentials. You know, I um, I just quickly grabbed a couple of the letters from that petition. I keep these at my nightstand and I focus on those pretty much every day. It's my reminder of um, what's going on out there, really going on out there. Um, you know, we hear the statistics, Kentucky is number one in abuse and neglect again. We hear the, the stories on the news that some child um, was um, terribly neglected and, and in a situation that's just horrible. And it was just a five second, you know, synopsis and a lot of us want to move on. But then there's the families that are actually in that and they're trying to resolve the situations with those kids. Kids should not be penalized. Abused and neglected kids should not be penalized because they go to family. That, that's the bottom line. These kids are part of a situation um, of an epidemic, I feel, of you know, dealing with substance abuse. And these kids are the victims of that. And we need to make sure that we come together and those kids have the resources that they need no matter where they are. And to me, that's a lot of what the summit is about. We've been growing in Kentucky um, and making leaps and bounds from uh, when I've looked at some of the stuff that's happened in, in some states, we've definitely come a long way. That, that little deafening silence to that little rumble to where I feel like today we're getting to more of a, um, a light roar um, to, to imagine all the possibilities out there. It's just, we're not there yet. We, we've got a lot more work to do. There's a lot more families that need more services. You know, um, a great an aunt, her name is Charlene and her, her note started out to me and she said, the hardest thing that I've ever done was swallow my pride and ask her help. I know a lot of other caregivers that have said pretty much the same thing. She said, I never thought that I would be that one asking for grocery money. I never thought that I would have to decide between buying groceries or taking my child to the doctor. I never thought that I would be that one that packs a lunch from home because I have to take my nephew to Bowling Green to a specialist once a week and I can't afford to buy lunch. 
and the stories just go on and on. There was a, a young um, lady named Katie and her story started out. She wrote me, she wrote a whole bunch of folks in the media. And the first thing that she said was, help, I'm falling through the cracks. What we want is to make sure that nobody else Nobody else's child falls through the cracks, that these kids get the services that they need. You know, um, I, I was reading something the other day, and it was a quote from Robert Kennedy. And, it, and to me, I'm going to start using this everywhere I can because I believe in the opportunities for more change for kinship families um, and actually all children that are in the system. But it was some men see things and ask why. And I dream of things and say, why not? Why not? Why not do more for the children that are in Kentucky? Why not look creatively and see what else we can do and make sure that a child that needs something, you know, very simple as food and shelter gets that? Why not dream for much more? So here we are. We're at this Kinship Summit. We're having these conversations. We've come a long way. Our rumble is at a roar. I think we are at, at the biggest point of potential possibilities. And um, it's just exciting. It's a lot more work to do. We got a lot more to talk about. And I am thrilled to be able to share with you the governor's uh, video talking about how we matter that we are here. Hey, Kentucky, it's Andy. I am proud to proclaim September as National Kinship Care Month in the Commonwealth. Here in the Commonwealth, nearly 100,000 children live in kinship care, which is when grandparents and relatives care for children when their parents are unable to. It allows Kentucky's kids to stay in a supportive home with family members that they know and that they love. This month, we celebrate the incredible family members across Kentucky who have stepped up to help provide a safe, loving home to our kids. Thank you for all you do as you make a difference in the lives of these children. Next, we'd like to hear um, on the national landscape from an expert um, who I will let introduce herself, um, Dr. Sharon McDaniel. Well, good morning, everyone. It is indeed my honor and privilege to be with you this morning. Norma, thank you so much for setting the context for this conversation. You're not a footnote. Caregivers are not a footnote and the why, we have to continue to ask ourselves why. Why do we do what we do? But why do we have so many challenges from the system? I'm reminded that I was a kinship caregiver many years ago of my 15 year old um, cousin many years ago. And I, I'm also an alumni of CARE. So I center the work that I do each and every day from my own personal lens. This is not work, this is a ministry. And Norma, as you were speaking, I was it, your words were just resonating with me so deeply. And so I thank you for all that you do. When I'm not at Casey Family Programs where I serve as a trustee, I am the president and CEO and founder of A Second Chance Incorporated. We've been around for about 28 years, but I also worked in the child welfare system before that. I left as an administrator because I wanted to see what was going on, my own experience. I wanted to understand how I could make a difference. And back in the 80s, I was actually placing young people with their kin because that was my experience. I was able to, my mom died like Katie. My mom died when I was um, just two years old. And my father made a decision that he wanted to place his three babies with his extended family. And we were placed with fictive kin. So we were not necessarily with people who were born to us by blood, but we were in his network, in his village. And that's what we're talking about today. We're talking about the village. We're talking about caregivers stepping up because not because they're just required to, but they have the love and the desire, but they also need resources. They also need resources. Norma, it grieves me to hear about the grandmom who's gone through her savings, that she's now a, a part of the new poor, 
grand families who are going through their, their savings, their retirement, they are a part of the new poor. And we ought to think about that. So in Pennsylvania, where I'm from, we actually pay grandparents from day one. And they, were, they are paid the same foster care amount for each child. So $450 per month per child. And I'll get into some of that as we talk. So I want to thank um, uh, Shannon for just inviting me, Anita Shannon for inviting me as well from Casey Family Programs. And I certainly want to thank the commissioner for being here today. I've had the pleasure of meeting with, meet with her before, and certainly she is a powerhouse and she um, is centered her work on kinship care. So also I want to thank each of you caregivers, advocates, who are here to learn more about the national landscape of kinship care. I also wanna honor the land that I sit, the Cherokee Nation, the Iroquois people, the Susquehanna and Delaware people. This is the land I sit in, in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So I wanna, I wanna move the slide ahead and I wanna ask you, how are the children? Can Syrian and Gera, how are the children? How you see the children will determine how you treat the children. So Kinsirian and Gera, how are the children? You can put in the chat, how are Kentucky's children? I want you to think about that. I also want you to think about the why. Again, going back to why are you here? Why are you an advocate? Why are you a kinship caregiver? Your why is important. And for the child welfare leader I, and the workers, I want you to understand that it's important that you think about what happens before you knock on the door. What is your attitude about the children and families that you will encounter? Do you think that family is not good enough? And if you don't think that, why? What if it were your family? Would they be good enough? So I want you to think about your why. We'll move to the next slide. So here's the Kentucky story. I'm a quasi researcher and I always wanna talk about data. And so we'll move through just to see what your data looks like. Next slide. So I'm proud to say that you all were really moving in a trajectory that you were having less kids coming into care. Now this is sort of dated, uh, data and I'm sure there's probably more updated data, but this is from the kids count report that just came out. And so you were moving in the direction that you were um, placing less children and you're on that downward uh, trajectory, which is a good thing. But I also want you to look at where, where the children are going. Next slide. This is, uh, this, is the, this is the raw data, but I'll also show you the, the uh, chart. But most of your young people are going in traditional foster care. Next slide. So you will see here that 67% of all your children that are going into out-of-home care are going into non-relative placement. And I think it goes back to what Norma is saying. So why is that? When we show up and, we, and the knock on the door, it really is our values. All that we do is centered in our values and belief about what we think about the families that's before us. So that number really ought to shift. It ought to shift. But I want you to see your data. Sometimes we don't know what's going on in our systems until we're able to see our data. Next slide. I also wanted you to see your data about your overall child well-being scores. And again, this is 2020 by the Kids Count Report. And you see, if you go down in the middle of this slide, you see that your overall ranking of all these uh, child well-being indicators, you're about 37. So you're in 41 in terms of economic well-being, 27 when it comes to your educational ranking, 42 when it comes to health, and 41 when it comes to family and community. So I think you know and you would agree that you're doing well in some areas, in some areas you have to improve. And that's 37 out of 50 states. So just put that in context. Next slide. So what's happening on the national kinship space? Shannon had asked me to really uh, just inform you of what other jurisdictions are doing around kinship care. And so I just wanted to spend a few moments talking to you about that. Next slide. 
So what Georgia is doing is they have a, what they call a kinship continuum. And they really are looking at how do they license more kinship caregivers in their system. They have, they have a, a hybrid payment, which is less than the uh, traditional foster care, but it's more than TANA. And so that's what they're doing right now, but they really wanna bring more young people and, and families to licensing, which they would get the full uh, foster care payment. One of the areas that I helped them with was this voluntary kinship program. And this is, when they looked at their data, they recognized that there were many children that one either should not have been removed or they go back home in less than 90 days. And so what I asked them to think through was how could they create a system where they could just pay the caregiver for that, the time that that young person was there, they did not have to adjudicate the child dependent, but work with the family upstream to get the young person home. And that program is working remarkably. So you're talking about not an adjudication, families are being paid short term, and the kinship caregiver becomes sort of the respite provider for, the, for their daughter so that they can really, the young people can go back home, grandma can move on with her life. And in fact, she's uh, reimbursed at the outset. So that's something that Kentucky might wanna think about when you look at your data. Next slide. So you know, you've heard that California, they have a law that it's mandatory, their California continuum of care reform that they're required to look at kin placements at the outset. They cannot place children in other forms of care if they have not ruled out uh, kinship care. I put the link in here, so don't worry about reading this. I put the link in here so that we will give you this uh, PowerPoint so that you actually can go and see what the continuum of, of care reform is all about. But their whole theory of change is that children belong in families, not in congregate care. They belong in their own families. And if they cannot find their family, if they, if they cannot be placed with their families, they can be placed in a loving home, a traditional foster home, but they must rule out kinship care first. Next slide. Florida has a, a relative caregiver program. They've had this for a very long time. They've had some fits and starts, but I think that they are on the right track in terms of how to in, in support kinship caregivers and how to ensure that they are receiving the same payments as foster care. And you heard about your case, you know very much about your case. It was your, your lawsuit. And, and trust me, you're not the first one. I'm gonna talk about a Pennsylvania's lawsuit, Allegheny County's lawsuit as well. So you are required to do um, many things. One is look at kinship first, but also pay them um, like you would pay traditional foster caregivers. Next slide. And then here are some promising practices that are in the California Evidence-Based Clearinghouse. And these are just support groups, intervention programs with grand families. And I'd like you to, again, look on this website so you can see some of the opportunities that you may have as you continue to build your program. Next slide. So now we're gonna talk about a second chance. This is the work that I do that I'm very familiar with. We'll go to the next slide. So I wanna, if we can click all of the, the buttons, I really wanted to uh, make sure that you will see everything. But we started in 1994, but these are the laws that ground the work that we do. So you need to understand that this is, this, is about a, this is a legal framework that allows us to do what we do. But I want you to go up to 1979. 1979, that is Joachim versus Miller. That is a U.S. Supreme Court ruling that says, kinship families cannot be discriminated against because of their relative status if they can meet the same licensing requirements as non-kin. And so we go back to 1979, you, your lawsuit is more recent, but it's the same core ideas that just because you're a relative, you cannot be discriminated against if you can meet the same licensing standards. Our, um, in Allegheny County, our lawsuit was the Rivera versus Allegheny County. And that was our lawsuit that then created a second chance. So the, the fact of the matter is we've been having this discussion for a very long time. Sometimes I think that I am 
in a time warp that we're standing still because I've been having these conversations for almost 30 years and I'm still having that I can really record myself, push play, and it's the same conversation. And many of the things, Norma, that you talked about. And so the other thing that happened once a second chance was established in 1997, the state of Pennsylvania was sued because there were 13 counties, including Philadelphia County, who did not have a kinship care program. So what they did was that the ACLU sued the state and they, they entered a consent decree. And so now across Pennsylvania, kinship care is uh, widely uh, spread out, known, and every caregiver, again, I want to underscore this. Every caregiver is paid day one. And what we do is, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, is that we actually have a, not a 60 day window in which we can license families. And the state and the counties pick up all of those resources during that licensing period. Next slide. So a second chance, our model is centered in our values, conviction, dignity, respect, and honesty. That's how we approach every caregiver, every provider, every organization that we work with. Next slide. And we can put all of the, the, the houses up as well, because I really want to um, underscore, this is what a traditional family looks like. The family dynamic, the child, we see the little um, red, red child, that child is in a home. Let's put up the next house. If we just click. This is the foster care dynamic. We remove everybody that that child knows and we place this child in the stranger home. That's what that child is experiencing. Everybody that they know is gone and they're in a new situation. Next slide, or not next slide, next uh, house. This is the kinship dynamic. The child remains in the family, in the house, but they are displaced with grandma, auntie, but they remain with people that they know. Next slide. We work with the triad and you'll hear that in the language in the vernacular, but a second chance really advanced this notion that you cannot just work with the caregiver, kinship caregiver. You have to work with the, the birth families. You have to work with the paternal side of the family and you have to work with the child. So we talk about the triad because we're working with everyone. That child should not have to uh, be uh, twixt in between and picking who they wanna be with. The family is the village and that's why we work with the triad. Next slide. Here's a licensing process that I talked to you about. What happens once the child is placed, we actually, we, we work with CYF, which is our agency, our child welfare agency. And we move that young person through, this, through the system, they're placed immediately and the caregiver is licensed in 60 days. We use the same standards. They're not less, you know, less than, so they are licensed at the same rate. We also say that we license in rather than license out. I know that I'm, I'm close to my time. I wanna go through a couple of more slides because I wanted to be able to answer a couple of questions. We'll go to the next slide. This is the process of the gold standard. And you all will get this so you will know exactly what we're, what we're doing. But this is our gold standard process. Our average time of licensing is 45 days. Next slide. Here are the services that we offer you will see the triad. Each group, we have services for the triad. They're all different. Next slide. We can go keep on going through that. My designer sometimes does a lot. Of, so these are, this is, the, this is the, the, the curriculum that we use to go through our uh, process. Uh, we can go to the next slide. These are the support services that we offer to our uh, caregivers. Next slide. This is a navigation program. And I wanna just to pause here. We are actually housed in the offices of our six county 
uh, child welfare organizations. I have a worker who is housed there. So they actually help the child welfare system understand kin that are available at the outset. We select at least three kinship caregivers that we work with the birth parents to identify. So we will talk more about that. Um, you know, you'll see this and you can go on our website to see more about our kinship navigation program. Next slide. So, and, and we go through all of that, the click, click, click. <laughs> So we are currently um, at 65% in Allegheny County of all children in out-of-home placement are in kinship care. In Philadelphia County, it's 58%. So you see most of the kids that are out-of-home care are in kinship care. I work with at the organization, me and my team, we work with about 1,800 children every day in our system. Next slide. And we just wanted to show you, we just click, we just can click all of those. You will see, here's how a second chance compares to the national um, average. And this is point in time data. We'll go to the next slide. Here's the number of uh, young people, birth parents, caregivers that we work with over our 28 years. So you see, we have a critical mass. Next slide. And here's the jurisdictions that we've worked with um, across my time and just got a call the other day. So we work across the nation with trying to ensure that people understand the value of kinship care and how it is better outcomes for young people. Next slide. Happy Kinship Care Month. And now I'll answer any questions that anyone may have. Thank you so much for your attention. This is just this is so remarkable that you're doing this. So any questions that people may have? Uh, Shannon, not sure, not sure how you wanted to handle that. Norma was going to facilitate. Um, she's got a couple of questions for you, but then also we recommend folks add those questions in the chat as well. But I think Norma's got some questions prepared. Great, thank you. Yeah, so that was an amazing presentation with some re really promising data. I, one of the questions when, uh, if I understood correctly, you're kind of vetting um, different family members to kind of to make sure that, you know, it's, it's the right place for the child and, and people are prepared and things. One thing I wonder about without knowing all the details is, is that a way, though, that states because let's say you pick a family member that has a little more resources, is that a way that states um, find savings in not providing supports? That, that's what I worry about is I, I don't wanna lose the momentum of the fact that these kids are in the system and there's certain services I think they should have no matter where they go. Yeah, it's not about resources. So it's not about who has the best resources, it's about who might, so you might have grandma who is 75, but the baby is three days old. So there might be another caregiver who might be able to support and grandma can be the babysitter or, or whoever. So it's not about the resources. And again, it doesn't matter. It's actually the birth parent who is actually selecting these caregivers. It's just that um, we work with them at the outset and say, if your child has to be removed because you may have another dirty tox screen, where do you want the young person to go? And we ask them to select at least three of them. And so it's not about resources. Everybody gets the same amount of money from uh, a second chance in the state. So that's not, a, not even a consideration, but thank that's you for the question. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, I think the commissioner had a question. You're on mute, Commissioner. Ah, I'm Did sorry, you? Norma. I didn't. I was trying. I was applauding Dr. McDaniel's presentation. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Does anybody else have any questions right now? Um, I, I mean, put I, my I put my response in the chat. Um, um, we're a recruitment and certification team here with DCBS in Jefferson County. And I think we have several of my team members here. Um, we would love to see something like Second Chance implemented. Some of our most difficult uh, certifications are with relative and fictive kin placements. And I think a lot of that has to do with um, families not being adequately prepared for the process. And so to have somebody from the outside who has the time 
um, and the resources available to help uh, the families with some of those roadblocks would be really wonderful. We all know DCBS is very short staffed as far as you know, the workers that we have available to provide some of these supports. So I'm really excited to see transportation you know, being a part of that service. Um, we have a family now that's taking a placement that you know, can't really manage going to pick up a crib, even though we've provided the resources, then how do you get to it? And so it's very difficult for us with the caseloads that we have 50, 60 plus to be able to support them in that and get through the process. So I'm glad to see there's some decision makers here that um, you know are hearing some of these innovative things that um, might be able to help my family, help our families. Thank you, Shanti. Actually, we we probably do about 2,500 transports a month. We have a whole separate division that just does nothing but transportation. So you're absolutely. Um, spot on in terms of that need. So thank you so much for your comments. So I'm going to ask another question, um, Dr. McDaniel, and, and I apologize if you covered this. So when you're looking at, you know, you're working with the parents to find where the right fit is going to be and working with the different family members to find the right fit, are the children, again, are they engaged in any of that piece? Are their voices heard as well? So absolutely, depending and, and certainly for for you know verbal, you know children and and teenagers for sure, because they you know it's really about where they think that they can be comfortable. So a part of and that's why we talk about the triad. We have to center the conversation in the in the child's voice as well. I remember when no one asked me about anything. I was a teenager, seventeen, and no one asked me anything when I was in the system. And so the fact of the matter is that's a value for us to ask the young person where they like to be placed. Any other questions? I just have a comment about all of this. Um, when we gain custody of our two grandchildren, I didn't know anything about kinship care to start with. And when I told my husband we were going to get custody of the, or they were at least going to start getting placed in our home, um, he said, how are we going to be able to afford this? And my comment was, if God wants it to happen, he will take care of us financially. That was my thought, my whole um, understanding of life. That's, he's going to put us there. So we're going to be okay. And then somewhere along the line, after uh, we were going to court regularly, I don't remember exactly how I got connection with somebody from Kinship Care. But at that time, the program only allowed for a flat $1,000, and it was to be used to help pay for a lawyer to gain custody, if that was our goal. And then the money ended. It didn't continue on for months on end. And so we were financially on our own. We made it. We're fine. Uh, the youngest of the two is a senior in high school now. And through the caregiver support group that is in Owensboro, last year or maybe two years ago, I heard about the potential of a new uh, kinship care, no, yes, kinship care program starting. But because we had custody, mm -hmm. I didn't feel like that we had any um ability to financially gain from any of that. So maybe as our family has lost out on some financial assistance, however, through various things have happened, we have gained child support from the parents through the court system. And that's a whole nother, <laughs> whole nother day's discussion. Anyway, we've done fine, but I hope that new families coming into this will be able to access more information to know that there is assistance out there. Like you said, there's families that have 
fallen apart financially because they didn't know where to go for help or they were at that borderline of not qualifying for food stamps. Mm -hmm. We've not gotten food stamps through this. We've been fine. But I know there are some that maybe it wasn't just one child they were trying to feed. It was several. And now through unfortunate circumstances with the pandemic, there are more food banks out there through a lot of churches that are stepping up to the plate and helping a lot of families in these circumstances. And I think that's wonderful. I hope that the kinship care program grows and is made more aware of through the court system, probably, that there's help out there for these families that are, it, whether it's short term that they're caregivers or long term like us, because we've had both these children since they were infants. Thank you, Ms. Thompson, for your voice in this space. And thank you all so much for allowing me this space to talk about a second chance. And I know that uh, the commissioner is up next. So Shannon, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Connie. And thank you again, Dr. McDaniel. And um, as Dr. McDaniel mentioned, um, Commissioner Marta Miranda Straub is up next and has um, some insight on the, the state as a whole and uh, has a lot of information to share. So I'll pass it over to her. Thank you so much. I'm really honored to be here. Thank you to Kentucky Youth Advocates for always lifting the voice of those impacted. Uh, certainly, Dr. McDaniel have a lot to learn and a lot to honor and cherish from your presentation. And uh, really glad that um, I was here to listen to you. Uh, extreme thank you to the Casey Family Foundation for always bringing expertise so that we can provide, um, we can grow and we can learn. A huge thank you to you, Norma, for always lifting the voice and bringing it to my attention and our attention. Uh, we are honored to have you work with us as a trust or advisor um, as we design a 21st century agency. We have a long way to go. We have begun some very important conversations, one about KTAP and how that program has not changed in over 30 years. And we're looking at revolutionizing that program as well, um, as well as how we deal with kinship and fictive care. Uh, we, we, our goal uh, is to diminish barriers and increase access and place the lift experience to those who we serve at the center of everything that we do. However, we're not there and we're incredibly honored to be here to tell you a little bit about where we are now. Um, I want to, um, I want to uh, do a couple of things. One is thank Maurice, who has agreed to present with me because many of you may not know uh, what we have uh, programmatically. And he is a program expert and can actually uh, give information and this PowerPoint will be available to you. A lot of what I think we don't do well uh, consistently is educate everyone about what we do and what's available and how to get there. So hopefully uh, um, we'll, get, we'll get more of that. Um, I want to say uh, that uh, kinship and fictive care is a priority on multiple levels for me as a commissioner. One, what happens is that child remains connected to their roots, to their heritage, to their culture, to their stories, to their family. And it's a lot less traumatizing than removing them to a brand new place where they may not have that understanding of who this child is. So although foster care is an important temporary service, kinship care and 50 care is the desirable placement uh, when the family member, the biological family is not safe or ready or capable of managing the child. Um, I was taken by an uncle uh, from the hospital after severe physical abuse by my mother who was not safe and was raised by my grandmother and my father as a result of that. So know that uh, both child abuse and um, healing uh, as well as kinship care is a priority. They saved my soul and that's why I'm here. Uh, so I bring my lived experience uh, from a rural place in Cuba uh, to what's happening here. So I'm very, very 
honored and humbled to have the influence and potential to impact change. However, we need your voices, we need your strength, we need your truth, and we need you to hold us accountable for doing good by you. Uh, and that's what our trust advisors are about. And we are excited about that. And uh, thank you to the Casey Foundation to helping us uh, be able to pay stipends for those who, of you who are working with us on designing a 21st century agency with a goal of decreasing barriers, increasing access and placing the lived experience at the center of everything that we do. So I want to, um, um, Thank you, Dr. Magdano, for this modeling. I want to also honor uh, the fact that we are on land forcibly taken from the Shawnee, East Cherokee, and Osagi people. And the lynching uh, in our state, where according to the Equal Justice Initiative, we had 170 African-American racial terror lynchings between 1877 and 1959. And two of them occurred in Franklin County. I want to give an Appalachian acknowledgement. We acknowledge our Appalachian region and culture and the historic economic and cultural oppression of its people and environment and degradation to its land. So uh, kinship and fictive care. Slice two, please. Family First Prevention Service Act. This is the first time I believe that we structurally and collectively made a huge impact on you, children and youth not going to uh, residential care. Uh, we were one of the first ones to take advantage of this federal opportunity and we invested in Family First and uh, the impact and outcomes of Family First are impressive. And as a result of that work, we're expanding and adding a division of primary and secondary prevention to the commissioner's office. Uh, we will go to the legislature and ask for that reorganization so that investment continues to be about moving ahead and beginning to support families and youth and children way before they need to come to protection and permanency. So I want to uh, honor that, that that was a huge impact for our state, a huge impact for us and a major growth uh, for us moving into prevention and to continue to reduce the amount of children and youth that would go uh, into residential care. That, I'm happy to say, continues to decline uh, regularly. So uh, prevention. Uh, our goal is to keep children with family. If the original family, like mine, was not healthy enough or safe enough for that child, uh, then, uh, you know, we first begin with, uh, you know, prevention. Maybe that, that biological family needs to go to treatment. Maybe they need a economic resources to be able to feed their kids. Maybe they need mental health support, et cetera. Um, the whole piece around family preservation. So our goal is to preserve family, to reunite families and to strengthen families. Um, kinship care is that valuable step. Those of you who care enough to take on the responsibility after you've raised your own, most of you are grandparents and aunties and uh, folks who have already raised your children or chose not to have children. And then all of a sudden your daughter or son is addicted or mentally ill. Um, and you end up with a child at your door that you were never prepared financially, psychologically, or emotional to handle. But you open your heart, you open your home, you open your pocketbook, and you, you say yes. And a lot of the times, one of our barriers is that our workers don't necessarily explore, they tell you all the options that you have, that you don't necessarily have to adopt, that you can be a foster placement and receive all of those, all of those resources that you deserve. We're working on making sure that you get that any Anyway, but we really need to do a much better job with that. Again, one of the challenges that we have, and uh, everyone does now, but we did before, is really having a healthy and stable uh, in, uh, capacity for our workforce. We have not paid a living wage to our staff. We have not provided uh, the uh, policy and support uh, on secondary trauma. We have not provided the expertise that is needed of content experts to, to bring new folks uh, to understand how 
It is that we work with complex trauma. Our goal is to reduce case loads between 15 and 18, uh, which is the best standards. Uh, folks are traumatized when they come to us. Um, so we are incredible, uh, uh, incredibly working on multiple things and we have a long way to go. Kinship care is a crucial link because between the biological family, the roots of that child, that connection to the stories, the connection to the culture, um, and the uh, availability to keep the child in the family. Um, the, the next step is foster care. And uh, then we have congregate care. And then of course we have the youth aging out. Uh, and we have not necessarily over time done a good job uh, making sure that there's housing support, uh, that there's emotional support, that there's mental health services. Um, so a lot of these young people struggle. So we have as a trust or advisors council now, we have youth who have aged out of foster care, youth in foster care, as well as biological, fitted king and adopted families, helping us identify where the gaps are, where the barriers are, and uh, moving forward with us in building a 21st century agency with a lived experience, uh, being the center of how we design and evaluate programs and helping us uh, stay accountable to the promises that we're making. Next slide. In 2019, this is the landscape for Kentucky. DCVS uh, became intentional in shifting practices in Kentucky to support relatives through the implementation of a streamlined relative service array. In 2020, which is when I got here, uh, we pivoted to provide services during the pandemic through video conference. So what we did was turn on a dime and my staff, although overworked and although underpaid, and although traumatized as well, uh, you know, we were dealing with a pandemic of the uh, COVID, but we were also dealing with a racial reckoning that we were all witnessing uh, as well. Um, and my staff turned on a dime and was able to provide virtual services. We have, we have to this day, a lot more participation in all of our training and supporting as a result of offering that. In 2021, we launched our Truster Advisors Group consisting of relative caregivers to provide ongoing feedback into DCVS 21st century strategic plans. So we together have uh, with partners and frontline staff, as well as leadership, we have designed in 18 months overarching goals for what a 21st century innovative agency will look like. And now we are uh, taking folks who have been giving us their voices and we are creating an actual council that will meet quarterly there will be a meeting where that role will be defined and then uh, the ongoing conversations between staff and the folks with live experience will be part of how we design, evaluate and hold ourselves accountable to the commitment that we've made about revolutionizing everything we do. For example, uh, KTAP has not changed in 30 years. Uh, we are redesigning a brand new business model uh, as a result of KTAP. We, we penalize people for having a contingency fund and then they lose, they lose funding as a result of that, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Move forward. Here's some of the data points. Uh, these are the folks uh, seeking approval versus approved versus informal placement. Um, and uh, as you can see, we have the caregivers approved home is 39.53%. And then the other two, which is informal, as well as uh, the folks that we have seeking approval. The service array option chosen by the caregivers mostly is receiving optimal support, of course. Uh, you're dealing with a child, a youth that you never planned on, that drains your psychological, social, and financial resources. And uh, then we have about 39 point of view, almost 40, who are, are receiving limited support as opposed to optimal support. This all needs to be blue, okay? That's the goal. Next. Okay, at this point, I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna ask Maurice, who is uh, one of my uh, program superstars uh, and who can answer, who can give you more information about the in-depth piece of the programmatic resources available uh, for kinship and fictive, uh, as well as um, 
you know, be able to answer questions later that are a lot more granular that I'm able, I'm able to do. So uh, thank you, Maurice, for uh, being willing to present with me and to present to us. Righty, thank you, Commissioner. So uh, as she stated, my name is uh, Maurice Lee. Some of y'all actually know me by Mo, but whenever you go to email me, it's Maurice Lee. So the relative infective kin service array, as the commission was talking about back in 2019, this became a new program for us. Um, caregivers, it gave us the ability for, to give caregivers the ability to seek proof as a false apparent or obtain custody. Um, you know, whenever DCBS is involved um, and there's, you know, children aren't safe in the parent's home and we have to place them outside of the home, obviously, our practice has always been to seek out relative and victim kin caregivers. So if that you know happens, a social worker then will go out, will begin to uh, assess your home to ensure that it's safe and ensure that caregivers are eligible for placement. Um, for the sake of time, I won't click the video link, but and we will share this PowerPoint. Um, but the link below it provides a breakdown of the service array clearly, so that way it's it's an additional tool that we use to help explain to families um, what their options are. While I always say your social worker should be your first tool, it just always helps to have something else there as well to kind of help you dive in and figure out what's best for your family. Next slide. So the service array, um, so a relative or victim king caregiver can be approved as a basic DCBS foster home, and meet all requirements for basic foster home approval. Um, we also created the child-specific foster care type, and it's for those who want to uh, maybe need a waiver for reduced training hours or have waivers of non-safety standards. So say, for example, if your home, if your home may not be able to be approved for basic if you have three kids and three bedrooms, um, a non-safety waiver, you know, you could maybe have a bunk bed in there and that would be your non-safety waiver. Um, while we do have the child-specific uh, type, we really strive hard to approve our homes all as basic foster homes, regardless. Um, any foster, any parent or any relative or fictive kin caregiver that's going through the approval process will receive $6 per day per diem up until the time that you're approved. And based upon if you're approved as a basic home or a child specific home, it depends upon you know, what your final per diem will be. If it's a basic home, it's $24.10 per day per child and a child specific is $11.51 per day per child. Um, whenever I'm explaining to the field, because one of my jobs is, is to reach out across the state and make sure that our workers are aware and have a clear understanding on how to explain the service array to our victim kin caregivers, we do have our recruitment and certification staff that will actually go into the weeds of the approval options with families at the informational meeting. Um, a relative is eligible for the relative placement support benefits at the time of placement. And what the relative placement support benefit is, is it's a one-time payment for that child that's being placed with that relative um, that may have an emergent need like you know, there might be a clothing need or you might need to get an extra bed or something. And it goes up exponentially. So if you're, if you're receiving two kids and you're a relative, um, it would be $700 because it's $350 per child. Um, historically, fictive kin placements have not been eligible for this relative support benefit. But with the recent passing of House Bill 492, um, fictive kin will also be eligible for this benefit in the future. And I can say right now that we're, act we're actively working on amending our regulation and we're hoping by the spring of 2022, we'll, we will be able to then offer this benefit to victim kin caregivers. But I need to let everyone know up front. It's also, while we were opening this up to victim kin caregivers, we were not a lot in additional appropriation to be able to to have the funds potentially to support all the caregivers throughout the year, but we are working with our legislators, hopefully to be able to gain additional appropriation because we want to be able to offer this to all of our relative and victim kin caregivers. Next slide, please. Um, so for our families that opt to seek custody themselves versus um, 
versus going through being uh, becoming a licensed foster home. Um, we have the Kentucky Transitional Assistance Program, KTAP, which is only for relative, relative caregivers. And I think I saw a question in the chat maybe about why it's only eligible for relative, relatives. It's because it is a, a federally ran program, TANF, and we have to follow their guidelines because they, because they, uh, because they, they're the ones issuing us the grant for this. Um, SNAP, um, that's, you know, our supplemental nutritional assistance program that's, you know, based upon income and then Kentucky's Children's Health Insurance uh, Program. I can tell you a good bit of our families that apply for that, more than likely, your child is not gonna be denied for that benefit. But with family support, I'm not an expert on all the charts and the, the graphs and whatnot on determining el eligibility. So your best bet is to call them at the number listed below to determine your el eligibility for those programs. Next slide. Um, child care. Uh, if CHFS was not involved in the placement of a child, um, the applicant can apply for child care income eligibility through the, the Division of Family Support, which is the same number on the other slide. But DCBS also offers child care subsidies through the Child Protective and Pre uh, Preventive Services Authorization on the Child Care Assistance Program. And to do that, you can email the relative.supports at ky.gov or call that number to reapply for child care. And that is only if DCBS was involved with placing the child care. Um, all of our information about family supports or benefits for relative or predictive can caregivers can be found at KY Faces. And whenever you get to uh, receive the PowerPoint, if you click on the KY Faces hyperlink, it will get you to that screen. Next slide, please. Um, I know a big thing and a big component has been about services that we offer to families that have informally taken placement. And so one of the new things that we've we've uh, done and launched with in partnership with UK is a uh, KY Kins, Kentucky Information Navigation Support. Um, it was created to support, support kin and fictive kin caregivers and it connects them with a peer supporter with lived experience. Uh, and some of them have lived experience as a foster parent and kinship care experience. Um, it's currently being piloted in two DCBS regions at Salt River Trail in Cumberland. And just to kind of give you an idea where that, that where that is, just in case you don't know, Salt River Trail is kind of outside of the Jefferson, Jefferson County. So you're dealing with Oldham, Trimble, Henry, Franklin, Nelson, Bullock County. And then Cumberland, Cumberland is the southern part of the state near Laurel, Pulaski, Whit Whitley, Bell, and so forth. Um, if you do have any questions about KY Kent, you can put something in the chat. Uh, my partner in crime with KY Kent, uh, Sheila Renfro, is actually here with us today. Um, next slide, please. Um, so with KYKINS, the caregivers, they receive weekly face-to-face -face meetings through virtual spaces such as Zoom or FaceTime. Each meeting, meeting is a minimum at least one hour. Uh, weekly phone calls happen, again, ranging from brief check-ins to extensive conversations. Uh, phone and tech support is needed for crisis-related situations. Um, Anyone can be referred to KY Kansas as long as you live within those two service regions. So you can self-report, uh, someone can do a referral on your behalf and Sheila would be glad to uh, take your referral. And if you, know, you agree to accept services, then she will gladly get you assigned to a peer support mentor. Um, Ken VIP is a program that's uh, new. It's designed to build a community among kinship and relative caregivers across the Commonwealth using virtual platforms and facilitators with group leaders who have lived kinship, kinship caregiver experience. Ken VIP offers caregivers a safe, accessible environment to seek relevant information and support specific to the, and support specific to the relative and fictive kin caregiver experience. Next slide. Um, another thing that's available is Just In Time Kentucky. Um, Kentucky Just In Time is a web-based service program that offers a variety of training opportunities to help prepare you for the next step of bringing a child into your home and support those who have taken placements. Um, and the good thing about Just In Time is these training opportunities are there just 
box, click of a button. Uh, some of the current trainings on the website pertain to kinship care, currently are co-parenting and kinship parents with the birth parents or keep it in the family. Um, the unique issues of kinship care. So, or if you're looking for a video around appropriate discipline techniques based upon the child, child's age, there's also videos and insights on that. Next slide, please. So now I'll turn it back over to the commissioner for this last slide. Thank you so much, Maurice. Appreciate your expertise and willingness to get the nitty gritty into what we can offer and where folks can get more information. Um, what's on the horizon for us? Um, Kingship Catalog. Um, a series of, uh, in, as well as a series of trainings decide to provide kinship caregivers with web-based training content uh, that can be assessed anytime, depending on where you're, uh, when you're able uh, to pay attention to it and be able to take it. Um, so it may be like at 9 p.m. on a Sunday it will be available to you, as opposed to having the structure uh, trainings that are during times that may not be feasible for you. Uh, the initial catalog of 10 topics will focus uh, trainings on subjects such as ARCs and IEPs, discipline, talking with teens, preventing child abuse, uh, et cetera. Trainings are completed at the training space and are generally 20 to 30 minutes in length. So short, but powerful ability to do that. That's part of our training catalog coming up. And training added as feedback from participants is gathered and trains are developed. So again, part of what we do is um, ask you whether what we're offering is helpful, what is not, what's needed, and then rework, retweak, and integrate it for the following time. So that will be the process uh, with a coming soon uh, kinship uh, catalog as well. So, um, uh, Maurice, I don't know if you've had a chance to answer uh, the questions on the chat that were very programmatic based. I, I answered the one I knew, but uh, not others. Um, so, and then we can open it up to see if there's anything uh, left in there. So while Maurice is looking at the chat, <laughs> um, I will be glad to, uh, if you would uh, unmute uh, and, and ask uh, anything that I can answer or that Maurice can answer, that would be great. And again, uh, you know, it, it's this is not, and this is my commitment to you as your commissioner uh, for the Department of Community-Based Service. This is not a one-time, uh, this is an ongoing feedback loop and ongoing getting questions, presenting, coming back, and ongoing commitment to make sure that we lift all families and all children, and that kinship and 50 care are, are primary uh, supported and trained appropriately so that they can continue to help us care uh, for, for the vulnerable children that you are helping to care for, uh, that you are a priority for DCVS, uh, certainly uh, with my leadership, um, and that we are doing everything we can, and we look at regulations, and we're looking at programmatic pieces about continuing to lift the resources and the support uh, for kinship and 15 care. Um, it doesn't make any sense that if uh, somebody who doesn't know the child fosters the child, they get more support than if somebody who knows the child and is part of the family uh, doesn't get the same support. That's one of those bureaucratic barriers that we are working through. I call it sand, uh, water on the stone. We have a lot of structural uh, issues that we need to address. We have a lot of staffing workforce issues that we need to address. We have an incredible amount of very old language and regulations and funding that needs to be updated. Um, we are 1950s dinosaur trying to get to the 21st century. No excuse. It's on us. It's on us to do it. And we can't do it without you. So uh, Maurice, anything that you see in the chat that uh, you can answer? Working on a response right now. Okay, thank you. So Maurice will answer in the chat. Uh, Shannon, I don't know how we're doing on time. Um, and I believe Helen had a question, but I don't know if anybody else does. Uh, uh, first, first, thank you for all the positive changes. And this is not, I know, a unique comment. Um, many of the kinship caregivers in the most dire straits 
do not have access to uh, internet. You know, their only access may be through a cell phone that their kids are also using for school. So please, perhaps the cabinet can lobby uh, in the legislature for increased access to broadband. I just think of the group that I used to facilitate in Louisville's West End and uh, none of the participants had access to um, computers. So uh, while it will help many, again, the men, those who may be in the most dire straits, again, fall in the cracks. Thank and you. Hel Helen, you're absolutely right. We see that in the rural areas as well, right. uh, in regards to access to bandwidth, um, as well as uh, you know, urban and rural folks living in poverty do not have right. access to Wi-Fi. So that's very much on our radar. Uh, in addition, as of June 11, we have opened all of our public facing offices. So we've always, although the pandemic, we've been dealing with families at risk and children at risk in person. However, we had not had um, access to all of our public facing offices. So anybody who will needs to be seen in person can come to our public facing offices and should be seen as well as calling our call center. Um, but we, we do have staff now in every office across the state where they can come and be seen as well. Right, um, I was just thinking more about the catalog. Training. Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, many of our staff, uh, has needs higher bandwidth uh, to be able to do their job. It is a huge issue uh, and one of those barriers to communication that comes with living in poverty and certainly living in rural areas as well. So we 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 agree and we are working on that piece. Thank you. And Thank you, Helen. And thank you, Commissioner Miranda Straub. We're actually going to be um, doing a couple of advocate virtual forums uh, uh, to, to hear about workforce and some things that are in development, but also some challenges. So I know that Representative Moser is on and she's got a small window before she has to, to run and, uh, and, and go run a committee hearing, actually. So we have asked Representative Moser to provide some remarks before we head into our panel with a couple of other folks, including an additional legislator. But um, Representative Moser, I can turn it over to you if you are ready. I am. Thank you so much, Shannon. It's great to see everyone. And I appreciate the opportunity. Um, I do apologize. I have a, a special committee hearing in um, six minutes. So um, to address the broadband issue, uh, the legislature appropriated $350 million out of the ARPA funds for broadband. So um, we're working on it. Um, I'm chair of the Health and Family Services Committee, and prior to this role, I served as the director of uh, drug control policy in Northern Kentucky. And so I have heard um, heart-wrenching stories of, of parental substance use disorders that often lead to children entering kinship or fictive uh, kin settings. And, and I know that this is just one example of, of um, many examples when caregivers selflessly step up for the children in their lives. And I've, I've talked to many, many grandparents who are raising their grandchildren. So I, I know of their struggles. And um, this is a topic that is near and dear to numerous uh, legislators, at least in the House of Representatives and the Senate. Uh, we have made huge strides and um, we will continue our work, obviously. Uh, we, we know that there are a lot of challenges. Today's forum is, is a great step in highlighting some of the, the good things that are happening and um, hopefully giving you the advocates the tools that you need to keep advocating for these families. Um, I know that a couple of weeks ago, Kentucky Youth Advocates hosted an event on adverse childhood experiences, races, and this is certainly something uh, that highlights how how to mitigate ACEs when children are experiencing a loss in their family structure or, or for whatever reason. Um, the supports that we can provide for fictive or relative care in shaping the child in their custody um, into a positive and loving situation, the better for the long-term care or long-term outcomes rather for the child. And um, I think that this is uh, probably obvious to all of us who work in this space um, but it's, it's um, something that we need to continue to encourage families 
uh, to do and to provide those supports when they do decide that this is something that they can they can step up and do um, when when it's needed. Um, you know, many times there is a lack of communication or there are policies that create obstacles and confusion or lead to frustration and anger and a lack of trust in all the parties. And so this is something that we can work on just in um, avoiding those, those communication breakdowns just through understanding the needs of the whole family and providing those supportive resources. Um, you know, as Commissioner um, Straub said, you know, really working on training our social workers so that they have what they need to um, to really be clear and supportive and uh, provide that therapeutic communication between all parties. Uh, we know that the benefits of kinship care are enormous to children. Um, we have a, a few different uh, types of kinship care, which I know that you all have talked about, and um, you've probably already talked about the daunting number of children who are in kinship care. 96,000 Kentucky uh, or Kentucky children live in a in some sort of kinship care um, re relationship or situation. That's 99 percent of the kids in Kentucky. Um, you know, much work has been done to help alleviate the systemic problems and to ease the burden on families with the primary focus on being on the health of the children. Uh, the Family First Prevention Services Act was enacted in 2020 with a focus on really reuniting those families. And kinship care is an important part of that. It's an important way to maintain those connections when families are struggling and um, we need to support those caregivers with with resources. So I continue, or I look forward to continuing my work um, with all of you. And I just thank you for all that you are doing for the families of Kentucky. So I'm so sorry that I have to run, but um, I have two minutes to get downstairs. <laughs> so thank you all, have a great, great meeting. Thank you so much, Representative Moser, and have a good meeting yourself. Um, thank you. At the next committee hearing. Thanks. Thank you. So um, we uh, we wanted to get some reflections from um, many different people who play a different role within the, the systems, um, whether it be uh, somebody who is experienced with kinship care um, as a kinship care provider or somebody who has experienced kinship care as a young person in care. We also have um, uh, a a legislator who is on who has a long history of supporting families and really championing kids issues. So we're going to take a little bit of time right now and um, get some insight from those key folks around where their head is uh, related to kinship care. So I know that we have um, House Minority Leader Joni Jenkins, who is with us. Uh, we will also have Altuan Dawson, who is a young person who has experienced care. Um, Norma Hatfield, who you have all heard from earlier today. And um, uh, we will be having some, some just kind of open discussion with those folks. So I, I'm going to start with Representative Joni Jenkins. Um, just to get some, some insight and maybe some feedback and reflection on Representative Moser's comments, but also um, kind of what you're seeing in your experience as a legislator over the years with kinship families in Kentucky. Good morning. Thank you so much for having me on. And I have to admit, I just jumped on here, so I missed uh, 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 Chair Moser's uh, remarks, so I hope I don't repeat anything that she said, as, as I'm sure she let you know, as we're in preparation for a possible special session. So things are a little wild here in Frankfurt, but boy, I'm glad to see uh, Ms. Hatfield and Mr. Dawson. Mr. Dawson and I worked together for many years at JCTC, so it's good to see him as well. Um, I think certainly the, the folks that have stepped up uh, to provide kinship care and effective care to our families that are kids that it's been deemed uh, dangerous for them to stay in their biological families, I think have been a, just a godsend to this state. And 
I'm always open to hearing great ideas about how we can better support those families that are helping us um, so much during, during that period of time. Um, you know, some things that I would love to see is some upfront um, expenses for them. Uh, I met with a woman in my district some time ago. She and her husband were preparing for retirement and they bought a cute little sports car. And she suddenly they had five kids and needed a car that could accommodate four car seats. Uh, I couldn't go out and buy that kind of vehicle uh, in two days. So sometimes there are special needs that families are going to have to um, uh, uh, procure to take care of those kids immediately. Oh, I'm still getting lots of messages uh, through the chat. Um, so I'm, I'm very open to looking at what would it look like to have a special pot of money that almost on a grant system that people could apply for to get those uh, upfront costs, you know, beds, clothing, um, all of those uh, uh, issues, I think are very important. And we might not think about that. And I think about, you know, on a sliding scale, having a monthly stipend for those families. Uh, what I have found from working with other families, are there are a lot of things that can really add to children getting to the best of their potential. And it might be things like dance lessons or um, money for athletic uh, equipment for them, anything to help them uh, normalize their daily lives and help them to thrive at school um, and, and get more to a, a normal place. Um, and there, there are some special considerations that we have to, to um, think about. Uh, I know that there have been cases where grandparents take in kids and part of the part of the, the agreements with the state are they can't have uh, contact with the biological parents and that creates some problems. So th those are issues that we all need to be uh, addressing. But we all know, I believe, that most kids do better when they're with their biological parents if it's at all safe for them to do that. And from working with older foster kids, I know that once they turn 18 or 19, sometimes one of the first things they do is reconnect with that family that they've been separated from. Uh, the bond is very, very strong. Um, hopefully, as I've caught the tail end of, of Chair Moser, as we talk about the families first, the, the being able to intervene early in lives, I think is a huge, huge boon for us. And I'd love to see us be able to keep families together whenever we can. And if it means intervening early in those lives, I would hate for any child to be taken from a loving family because there are economic concerns. I really I'll, appreciate I'll, I'll stop and listen now. Well, I appreciate your thoughtfulness around this. And of course, um, not only did you talk about barriers, but you talked about solutions, which I think is where your mind is always focused, uh, Leader Jenkins. I'm wondering if Norma or Altwan um, have any reflections on, on those barriers or solutions or, or um, would like to identify some of the, the ones that they've been thinking about. I certainly uh, can go ahead and speak. You know, when I think about barriers, um, just right off the bat, um, I think it's the the lack of preparation because it happens so quickly. And uh, you know, uh, Dr. McDaniel talked about with with the work that she's doing that that potentially can be reduced. But you know, some of it that I see is um, a lack of. I don't wanna say training because I think training is definitely needed. I know we're looking at doing some of that, but also um, a lack of uh, counseling, a lack of legal support. Um, I can't tell you how many families that I talked to said, well, I was told to go show up in court and you know, I, I don't understand what's going on and I don't feel like some of this is right and I don't feel my words are getting out there and I need some legal support or, um, you know, I need the paperwork so that I can get the kids in school and that's not happening or, um, you know, do I adopt down the road? Those kinds of things are, are huge barriers. I can, I know that we spent, 
we lot we stopped counting after ten thousand uh, dollars on legal support just to get our kids out of foster care because there was a mess up in the system in the first place and we ne we never had a phone call um but even to navigate that whole process you know and i'm telling you thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars i hear from so many other caregivers so i would say lack of legal supports there um i know that um i think when we talk about preservation of families another thing that i see is there's no uh, reunification focus on the entire family unit they focus on the child and they focus on the bio parents but there's so many dynamics going on with the kinship caregivers at a broader perspective and that can create a lot of problems and long term i think we have to look at reunification of bringing that whole family unit together and that's just uh, just another one there i want to speak more into what was just said uh, from from my personal experience as a young person who grew up in in the system in in the different environments that one might might travel um so I lived with uh, a few of my aunts at, at a point in time, but in, in a particular, um, in, in 2000, um, me, and my, me and my sisters were placed with one of my aunts in Richmond, Kentucky. And I don't think that there was many supports um, provided. And I don't think that there was a willingness to learn that dynamic of what things were like in the home um, before the placement and then in my aunt's house. Um, there was not a, a, a thorough investigation to, to, to see if that uh, placement was fit for the people, um, me and my sisters, the young people to stay in that home. Um, and so that came with its own trauma <clears throat> that you, you may not be aware could happen in a home once the state releases custody to their kinship parent or guardian. Um, so speaking on that family dynamic is extremely important and to focus there when we talk about reuniting families, I think is essential to making it actually happen. Um, just knowing the family is what we mean when we say family dynamic. Everyone has a family dynamic. Um, the way we learn to, to care for one another or not comes from our family dynamic that we were raised on and the values that we carry um, that portray those things, um, help us to portray those things. Um, so yeah, I think learning that family dynamic is important and also the trainings are important as well. Um, the family needs trainings and counseling. Um, and it, this is also just a better way to understand that family dynamic and break it down in a way that's more therapeutic for everyone. Thanks for that, Altalan. I know that when Dr. McDaniel talks about the triad, we see a lot of gaps in how to navigate those relationships, especially if it's a family member, a close family member, um, like a, a son or daughter who you're, you're taking children in from or close aunt or uncle. There's a lot of tension in those relationships and there's a lot of things that you are not quite prepared to navigate that you have to figure out how to navigate really fast, right? That placement happens and then you're having to make decisions on, do I take custody? Do I become a foster parent down the road? Are we talking about adoption? And I think that there's a lot of need for, for supports that, um, that, are, that we just haven't really gotten to yet in Kentucky. Um, I'm wondering if there are, um, if there are examples of things that you all have seen re related to placement that you've seen that has went well in situations related to either that dynamic or just more broadly uh, when kinship placement happens or fictive kin placement happens, like what do, what do you think has been a, a real 
a benefit to those families that you've seen of late? Are there any bright spots that you can think of? It, kinship care is a bright spot in itself. Uh, so to not be removed completely from the home, right, and family, um, it's, it's another level of preventing trauma. Um, I, I appreciate everyone's hard work to make to making sure that the system becomes what it should be. And uh, thank you, Commissioner Miranda, for, for your hard work. Um, thank you, Joni, for your hard work. Uh, <laughs> I appreciate all of you folks, uh, wonderful women that I've met along the way that has helped guide me on my path. Um, I, I think that it just, when, when, a, when a young person has an opportunity to voice um, just their concerns in a, in a situation, and we talk about the importance of uh, youth voice and, and making sure that young people are heard, um, I think that that creates opportunities to create um, those, those positive environments um, for a young person. Uh, therapy also, um, and that's any situation that's that's with a kin and caregiver, or that's in a foster home, or that's in residential, um, with the family being a part of the treatment, um, and just keeping that support network um, built for that young person. Um, is a, is a highlighted positive. Um, so kinship care, I think, is a is an alternative route to to completely um, removing a child from the family. So there's a positive there, and I think we should focus and be excited that we have options for alternatives. Um, and then um, we do have those other alternative treatment centers and facilities for young people. Um, But the, the point of what I was wanting to, to express there was just that our young people's voices need to be elevated. Um, and as long as they are, that does create that opportunity for a positive atmosphere and environment for the entire family. As I'm sitting here thinking about the I'm wondering if it is possible to set up maybe a navigator position within the cabinet and use some of the folks that have been through this, like Norma Hatfield, who have, have been in the system and watched it to create almost like a, I guess, a peer educator or community supports person uh, to help folks newly uh, in the system to, to navigate the system and to let them know what questions they should be asking, um, helping them in, in the, the legal uh, arena as well. Uh, I, think, I, think we, I think that that could be set up as a payable position, maybe by contract or something like that, because so often we rely on advocates to donate their time when really we should be uh, rewarding them for, for stepping up and helping um, so that's something that I've made a note of, of looking at, is it possible to create within the cabinet a contractable position as a navigator or peer support specialist? And that could be a caregiver who's gone through the system, or it could be a former foster youth who's been through the system. And I think when we talk about creating that supportive network, I think having that person there is extremely helpful for the young person involved. Um, just knowing somebody's going to be there, um, somebody they can talk to. Um, and I, in preparation for this discussion, I did talk with Debbie and uh, Nikki Thornton um, to to you know get some of my ideas this down. Um, and I think this this was one of the those that came up. Um, just to have that supportive person for the young people involved in the situation. 
So I just wanted to comment as well. I think what Antoine said is, is so important. It's building a system by the people who run the system does not always work so well for those who need to use the system. And it's about, you know, hearing our voices, um, you know, showing the value in using those voices as we build something. You know, there was talk about a training catalog and all of these things out there. If, if, we, if we get to work with that as things are being built, then they're more likely going to be used well as they could be. And I think just ha you know, getting the opportunities like here um, in, in all the different forums to have that lived experience voice, no matter what perspective we're in, whether it's biological parent, whether it's the, the child, whether it's the, the father, you know, grandfather, grandmother, aunt, uncle, um, neighbor, I think that that's where you really get to building something that is really going to be used and is needed. So when in, we've been talking a lot about um, things that we'd like to see happen, um, what are some um, what are some potential policy changes that we think are necessary in order to move us to where we want to be? We've been talking a lot about potential programmatic pieces, bringing in peer support for young people. And and relative caregivers, but what do we think needs to happen on the policy or or budget level that might influence some some systems change in order to improve uh, kinship families uh, situations? I'd like to see more budget monitoring, um, just in the areas where money is being sent to families um, to take care of the child in the home. Um, my experience this is differ from being in one aunt's house where we were treated like my cousins. And I mean, for us to be young people, it was just kids loving kids, right? But uh, the difference is that another aunt's house we were treated differently um, by, by the caregivers and they would, um, my lunch or my dinner might be a bologna sandwich and some Roman noodles or in, in a bag of chips versus Captain D's that my cousins got to go out to eat and um, shopping for new clothes that my cousins got to go experience. Um, and th these are common, this is a lot of, this This sounds very common to some of my peers' experience as well when they've been in, in similar uh, housing situations. Um, just monitoring that budget, making sure that it is equitable um, an equitable living environment for, for every child. So some of the policies that I see, and it kind of goes back to a little bit about what Eltwine talked about is, you know, these kids are removed from everything they know, good or bad, it's, it's what they know. Um, they walk out of their house with what's on their back. My kiddos had pajamas on and no shoes. Um, and they, they brought one thing with them and it was a little blanket and the foster mom threw it away. Um, just because it was so, you know, bad in such bad condition. Um, we're doing, I think we need to relocate tap, which I'm glad to hear that that's being done. But I think that we need to step back and look at what are the barriers that are in place that keep families that should be applying for KTAP to do so, such as the child support thing? Um, what, what are we doing as we implement um, Kinship Foster that we could do better? You know, it is an example. Um, there's two different versions of Kinship Foster. And if you don't meet the right bedroom size, um, you get less, you get less resources. And, and, and in essence, what that does is it says that those who have less get less and those who have more get more. And I think it's about just stepping back and saying, take, take all the bureaucracy out of the way. This child's been removed. What does it take to make sure that that child ha has the food that they need, has the clothes that they need as normal like, you know, as much as possible in a day-to-day -day 
um, that they can be. And so take everything else out of the mix. I know there has to be a budget, but relooking how we allocate the resources that we do to kind of get to a better place for those kids. So I'd like to chime in since I am part of DCBS and you brought up a really interesting point or points were brought up about um, how to reach the relative and pick the pen caregivers more. And I really personally see the need for peer support specialists or the idea of someone who has the lived experience because I can tell you like with our, with the peer support program that we're partnering with and with UK, they, they listen to that peer more than they're going to listen to a DCBS worker. And I've said this, you know, thousands of times and, you know, it comes, it all comes back to the idea of money, you know, what we, what we need, but there is the notion out there that we know that I would prefer someone to be like, well, I give a presentation on the service array. I really would prefer it come from a peer who's lived that and done that, who can tell them straight up what the pros and cons are because like they, they know what it's like. They know what the dynamic is to go this route or that route. And they're going to they're going to accept that information more than from them more than an actual DCBS worker. And so, I mean, that is you know ideas that we have we have talked about and things that we encourage. I mean, I know we're trying to expand KY Kent, but there's you know there's only so much we can do with what we have. But there is you know it's it's really important, and it's also important to realize like this that it can be beneficial for everyone. We actually had someone who come through the program who was a foster parent, right? who had went through all the foster parent training, but chose to take custody this route. And so, you know, we did a referral for her and she even talked about herself, how it was so helpful to have that particular set of expertise, just dealing with relative caregivers. So, and I mean, not to get into what DCBS is going through, it's, it's a lot to ask a social worker to not only to ensure safety in homes, but also tell you all the benefits that are available to them at the same time. Like, unfortunately, we're going to miss stuff here and there. That's why I think it's really important to take some of that burden off of them and place it on the people who have that lived experience that that caregivers are going to trust more. Let I me mean, let's just be honest that they're going to trust more from hearing it from them than from a DCBS worker. Yeah, and I, I just appreciate you saying that. Um, I, I, I feel like that, you know, we're, we're trying to get somewhere, but maybe it's just about relooking some of the things and, and how that's communicated. I, I know that when I saw on Kentucky Faces the video that was going to talk about all the different things in the service array for kinship families, I was at a loss. And I had to go back, and I sort of knew a little bit about it. And I think hearing it from somebody that understands from their point of view in the system, this is, hey, everybody, this is how it works. And, ha and, and approaching it that way kind of makes it, I think the communication gets a little better um, and people would then better understand the services that are available. So I really appreciate that comment. And I just wanted to let you know that. Representative Jenkins, based on what you're hearing, and I, and I think I heard a, um, uh, some advocacy around the need for um, funds related to that Kinship Navigator program, but are there other areas that you have been looking at or considering as we prepare for the 2022 session? Well, I think, you know, we could probably never put enough money into this program to do it justice. Um, you know, we had to roll back because it was such a robust program back in the, gosh, uh, I can't remember what year we rolled it back because it had grown to, you know, millions of dollars. Um, but we still, we do know that the kinship and, and victim uh, families save us so much. It's much more expensive on the state to put a child in foster care. And we have some excellent foster homes uh, throughout Kentucky and folks that do really good jobs, but I still am a firm believer that keeping kids with their family is the most effective, efficient, and it is the most cheapest, it is, is more economically feasible for the state. So looking at how we can put monies in the budget to expand the program 
and to give those kinship families the supports that they need to you know, get started and to maintain a good, healthy uh, atmosphere for the kids that they are taking into their homes. So I'm always an advocate for let's try to increase that every, every budget session we go into. So I'd, I'd like to ask a question to the panelists and um, I kind of uh, add, added Maurice here. And Maurice is a guest panelist as well because he provides so much fantastic insight. But Eltuan, Maurice, uh, Norma and Representative Jenkins, um, you know, what? Uh, what is one thing, if you had a magic wand what is one thing you would change to improve the lives of children in kinship care and fictive kin? Like if there were no uh, analysis of feasibility and, and we had uh, one thing that we could do, what, what would that look like? If we had no analysis of feasibility, then kinship care would probably not exist um, with that magic wand. Um, <clears throat> just, I think that if we can help parents be better parents um, by allowing ourselves to provide supports that can support that parent in the home with the child. And, and that's not necessarily true for every family, um, but I, I'm pretty sure as hard as we work, we can work just as hard to keep our kids in their homes uh, with their parents. Um, my magic wand. <laughs> I can go next, I guess. Um, I would say if I had my magic wand, I would, I feel like things are just not equitable. I mean, it's so many levels in the system anyway, but if we're talking specifically about kinship families, I, I would say we would wipe out the stigma and the bias that goes along with a family member stepping up under some really terrible situations um, within their own family um, and, and that that bias would go away and the services that that child needs, the, the child that's in the system, the child that's been abused and neglected, that child would receive the services that they should and not be penalized for being placed with a family member. So Norma kind of stole mine. I was thinking of the idea of not viewing, regardless of if we're placing in a foster home, a relative's home, or a fictive kin home, whatever immediate need that is there, we can supply without having to worry about where it's going to come from. So not worrying about like, you know, are we at the point of, are they eligible for this fund? Do they qualify for that? Do they really meet the SNAP guidelines? Those types of questions. So like if there's like an immediate need or need in general and continuity across the board. So like not having different policies for one set versus another, if it was, you know, linear across the board, then I think that would make, you know, that'd make the system go around for kinship care, right? I think, you know, I, I like the point that Elton made about supporting those families very early on. The very first intervention should be built around strengthening that original family unit. Um, I would like to see us spend twice as much money on prevention uh, as we do now. Uh, and I love the idea that it's child-centered, that it, it starts with the needs of that individual child and works out from there. Um, that, that every child in Kentucky could get what they individually need to be a successful adult. Now, I've always long talked about the consistency in a child's life, that there are adults and their appropriate adults in their life throughout, whether that's within their family unit or through their school system or support systems that identifying that 
And I know Representative Jenkins knows that firsthand with her experience working with young people who've aged out of the system, how important that is, and that work uh, has been incredibly impactful. Um, so there are 75 advocates. This is my the last question for the panel, but there are 75 advocates or potential advocates on this forum, and that's a lot of action. That's a lot of potential action. I would like to know from the panelists, what is one thing that you would ask the folks who are listening in um, and are here today to take action on as we move forward? This isn't just a one-time conversation. This is a conversation that's going to continue on potentially for years to come. Um, but what is one thing that you would, would um, ask folks around the table, uh, the virtual table, to take part in as we move forward on this work. I would say to watch as we go into a budget session. Uh, January of 2022 is a budget session where legislators will be evaluating. It's a great opportunity for you to connect with your state representative and state senator and talk about how important these issues are. Sometimes these issues get very hidden among all the other thousands and thousands of requests that we get for funding. Now is a good time to make connections. Once we get into session, it becomes a little more difficult, but reach out to your state representative and your state senator and talk about how important these issues are and have an ask ready that you want to see uh, increased money, that you want to see peer support specialist, or you want to see increased money for kinship care. You want to see increased money for prevention services. KYA does a great job of kind of filtering through all those things into a blueprint for kids. So I would encourage you to look at this year's blueprint and find areas there that you agree with and you are willing to advocate for. So I would say the same. Um, there's the same, the squeaky wheel that gets the oil. And I think that wheel has got to consistently squeak. And eventually it squeaks enough to whether I want to do something about it. So it's about, you know, being a thorn in their side about the issues that, you know, the kinship care families deal with. I know at DCBS, we would love to tackle more and we would love to do and add more, but, you know, there are limitations and like um, like what was said, like it's a budget year. This is a time that hopefully we can fight for more appropriations to be able to do some of the things that people are requesting and trying to do some new things to be able to offer more services to informal placement. So be a, let your legislator know and your senator know what your, what your issues are and, it's, you know, we want to see something done about it. And I'm just gonna um, echo a lot of the same things. That what goes through my mind is use your voice, uh, contact your legislators. I can tell you that when I first started having to navigate the system myself and I saw things that I thought, oh, this, this gotta change. Um, I wrote letters, I wrote emails, I, I, every possible way for almost two years and I got nothing, nothing back. I was frustrated. I remember at one point I told my husband, I said, well, I guess I'm just going to have to give up uh, because nobody wants to listen. But, but I didn't. Um, you know, I, I, I went to the Kinship Coalition. I went to KYA. That, that's what we had to do. That petition that we did with all of those voices that, that the legislature got, it did make a difference. And I think it's keep, keep on, keep on. Um, whatever that is, if you need kinship care, if you need assistance on mileage while you're having to drive to supervise visits, if, if you um, feel like, you know, the system is just biased and there's something going on, whatever that is, or if it's working well, we have to use our voice and we have to keep on and keep on and keep on. And that's how we get change. That's, we, I guess it's kind of like Mar said, it's the squeaky wheel and we have to get our little rumbles to roars, our voices to where they are just very clearly heard. And, and this summit is a part of that as well, but we just can't give up. We have to keep pushing forward. Well, 
not just making sure that our voices are heard too, but the young people's voices that we represent. Um, we have to make sure that is the focal point, the young people that we serve. Um, we, you, I'm sure that everyone other than me has been doing this for a little bit longer than, than I've been alive, maybe, or maybe you're new to it, but you know how hard this work can be. So to make it easier, elevate the young person's voice, hear what they have going on so we can make things mutable for everyone. Thank you all so much for that. So I heard contact your state senator and state representative. I heard stay persistent and um, keep an eye on the budget as, uh, as the budgets are being passed. Uh, listen and create space for voices to be heard, um, especially those who have experienced this and just keep at it, right? Um, this is going to take time. Uh, as Terry likes to say, it's a, I think this is another crock pot solution rather than a microwave. Um, I like that analogy. Um, so um, I actually have been uh, back and forth in the chat with Ms. Shantae West and um, she had asked if she could provide a quick comment and um, we've got some time, so I'm gonna allow for her to do that. And then if there are other questions or comments, please go ahead and put those in the chat, but I wanted to give her a minute um, if you wanna introduce yourself, Shantae. And uh, sorry, y'all, I am really uh, passionate about this. I'm Shantae West. I'm a supervisor in the recruitment and certification unit here in Jefferson County. So we approve um, those child specific families as foster care or child specific homes. And we're really passionate about doing all that we can to get these relative and fictive kin uh, providers approved. And so I appreciate all of you all being here. Um, we see a lot of the barriers. We have a lot of concerns about some of the things that prevent our relatives from uh, being able to be certified. And so, you know, my team is here. I think we have like three people from my team um, that have been blowing up my text, being really engaged throughout this process. And I, I really appreciate Eltuan because he said a lot about, you know, how we feel about what's going on. It's really difficult um, for these relative uh, providers to do the same things that our foster parents are able to do as far as take time off work, as far as having the resources to have the environment of the home be appropriate. And we want nothing more than for these families have the resources that they need to be approved. We know that there are waivers out there, but unfortunately we see every day a new situation come up that the waivers unfortunately just don't cover. And there's been times when we have had to not approve a family because of the legislation because of the standards of practice that we're required to operate under. So to everybody on this call, we really do need you all to get in contact with your legislators. Um, you know, um, uh, Helen, who, who's been a long advocate for our kinship family, she did say that, you know, families that go through this process, they know a lot about what's going on. Unfortunately, you know, a lot of the DCBS workers know too much about the barriers also because we're in here doing the work and it makes us very upset sometimes when we can't approve relative caregivers. And unfortunately, you know, we can't do all things. And so if there is some type of support outside of DCBS workers to support these families and the peer supports are good, a really big part for us though, where we're lagging is that we're looking at families entry um, when children are taken into care for those investigative workers um, to be doing home studies on the fly when they're removing children. And so because of that, all of the legal options that are available to families, unfortunately, just aren't explained thoroughly too, of or too often. And so by the time those families make it to our unit to be finally approved, unfortunately, you know, some of those waiver issues haven't been shared or discussed the training options haven't been discussed and some families don't have time for that. Um, as Eltuan spoke to, we find it very important that these families have mental health support 
to deal with what they're being thrown into. And it makes us so upset when we don't have those resources to provide to families. So we're flying by the seat of our pants to try to make sure that these families are supported. You know, And as I said earlier, it's just really difficult when we have caseloads of 50 and above to be able to give these families the support that they need. Um, one of the most concerning things is by the time the families home make it uh, to our unit, um, they've been given incorrect information. And so that sets us back on timeframes. And unfortunately, some of the services that have been shared with families aren't actually available, but workers hope that they are and just send them to our unit um, kind of blindly sometimes. And by that time, they're already halfway into the process. So um, my workers are here and they're making a, a, some comments. DCBS in Jefferson County would love to work with any support groups or any process where we can improve this for relatives because it breaks our heart. Even though we work with foster care and adoption, we absolutely believe in reunification when safe and possible. And so sometimes that doesn't mean placement back with biological parents but it means with relatives. And so where the legislation and the law will allow us to place with relatives, we would prefer to do that. We don't have enough homes for all of the children coming into care and they all are not appropriate for the kids even when we do have the homes. So we would love relatives to be able to step up and care for their kids. Um, when we talk about legislative advocacy, we would love to see a process where it doesn't possibly have to come through uh, foster care for approval. We understand due to Title IV-E um, that that is what's most feasible for the state as far as um, reimbursement for some of these costs. So uh, to Representative uh, Jenkins and Moser that were on the call, you know, we're really hoping that there's something that you can do in Frankfurt um, this coming session to address some of the issues. And the last thing, and I'll, I'll go ahead and, um, you know, get off. This also means making sure that we do have enough workers. And unfortunately, you know, we all know that the salaries that these workers receive are not enough for us to keep workers in. And so we lose consistency with these child specific and relative caregivers when they switch through two and three workers in a matter of months because DCBS cannot keep workers in place to provide consistency for these families. So please take it very seriously that we need to advocate for child-specific and relative caregivers. Thank you, Shante. And I'm floored by the expertise that we've heard, like the, the folks that we've heard from and the amount of knowledge that they carry um, and the amount of passion uh, for advocacy. So thank you again to um, Representative Joni Jenkins Thank you to Norma Hatfield, Altuan Dawson, and then our, our guests, uh, Maurice and Shante, for providing those comments during our panel. Um, I um, am going to kick it over to Dr. Terry Brooks to provide some, um, some words of action as well. Terry, unmute yourself, please. Now, is that better? Always unmute and mute confuses me. So uh, I was getting ready to say, uh, first of all, thanks for all of you being on this call. Uh, this is such a, a core issue for uh, Kentucky and for families and for KY. So we appreciate that. Uh, so a call for action. I'm a little intimidated and I can't see everybody on the screen, but I see Joni and I see Anita Shannon. I see Helen Dinas, so you got some wisdom on here. So I feel some pressure to, to come up with something. And uh, I, I think I would suggest to you two different frames to think about. Act with your heart and talk with your brain. L let me just tell you what I mean by that. Uh, I am still caught up, Shannon will remember this. Uh, she and I had a conversation with a, a Wall Street Journal uh, reporter who was doing a, a series on child welfare in America. And she shared with us what I still think is a fascinating kinship support in Arkansas. Uh, it's called The Call. And it's a series of faith communities, uh, not coordinated, very uh, congregationally based, but they've come together and they've decided 
uh, that they are going to offer kinship families in their area the power of frozen casseroles and the power of homework help every afternoon. Now, they are not calling Little Rock. They're not asking a single representative or senator or anybody in the administration to help them. They listened to kinship families. And what they heard is sometime on a Wednesday night, if I could just run by and have you work with my grandkid on that math that I don't understand, I'm going to have three grandkids this evening and I'm just predicting what I'm not going to understand. So I'm, I'm channeling my grandparentship to Arkansas and it's been a tough day. And if I could just get a frozen casserole, that'd be great. So when I say act with your heart, that's an encouragement to trust your instincts because I know that all of you know a very immediate, a very tangible, uh, a very relevant way that you could help a kinship family, whether that's through your faith community, uh, a civic group, or, or just being a neighbor. So that's really important. The flip side, and, and you heard our panel talk about it, uh, I'm going to tell you that despite what you hear uh, about the polarization and toxicity of the political climate in Frankfurt, I am so encouraged. I'm so encouraged because Joni Jenkins and Kim Mosier uh, and uh, their, their colleagues in the Senate, this is an arena that binds folks together and it doesn't divide. And I would suggest to you, not just potentially maybe going into a special session, uh, there are maybe three things to keep in mind. Uh, and obviously, Representative Jenkins can nod her head or shake her head, and you'll know if I'm right or wrong. Uh, first of all, uh, consensus on an issue is so important. So one of the challenges that we have on this call is, is, is let's do the hard work boiling down priorities. Uh, I am telling you from uh, Secretary Friedlander, from uh, the governor's budget office, I think Joni and Kim know this, there's actually a rare moment where money is not a barrier, money for creative uses than we've ever had. Uh, that money also crosses sectors. So for instance, uh, while we traditionally look at CHFS, I wonder what would happen if we looked at education dollars, because do you think there's any kinship family that would like some support with NTI or closing the gap? So we've got available financing that we have not seen and we may not see, we don't put our elected leaders in a spot where they hear 27 priorities. Because if they hear 27 priorities, they can't please everybody. So again, I, I look at a Norma who is such a great unifying voice. And, and we've got to do what is tough discipline, which is all this is important, but let's think about what we really are going after. What, what, are, what is that minimal targeted consensual budget ask. So, so that's number one. Uh, and, and again, as, as Shannon mentioned, uh, I think I'm open to this. Uh, and, and Joni uh, represents that or exemplifies it, is we, they get the long-term proposition. They, they get the fact that, that uh, maybe, just maybe, uh, kinship families could actually get help as soon as the special session. Uh, Representative Jenkins, Representative Mead, Senator Givens, and Senator McGarvey were on Kentucky tonight, Monday night. One of the things they talked about was the impact of the pandemic on the foster care, child welfare system, kinship families. So uh, do we have an opportunity maybe as early as next week to, to take a step forward? A absolutely. We have a big opportunity in January because that's when that budget uh, for two years is going to be crafted. And, and I would suggest to you that when it comes to, to the, the, uh, the sector of child welfare, uh, for the last several years, 
the General Assembly, both chambers, both parties, have demonstrated a long-term commitment. The other thing that I believe the General Assembly is poised for is to tackle uncomfortable data points about lots of sectors, and that includes kinship. So, so here's the bottom line. There are disparities based upon when it comes to kinship care. And I'm gonna to suggest to you that January of 2022 is the time to tackle those, to tackle them in an upfront creative way where we can make sure that not a single little boy or a single little girl in Kentucky opportunity for kinship care is limited by either their zip code or their kinship family. So Shannon, I know the time clock's on. So I would encourage you to act with your heart. Little things mean a lot. Frozen casseroles hunt. And secondly, as a, as a group, as a team, uh, as folks who care, let's apply the discipline to have a consensual focus. And then I believe we can talk to the Joni Jenkinses, the Kim Mosers of this world. And we can say, here's priority spending issues. And here's some tough policy issues around disparities that we want you to tackle too. So I have a lot of confidence in the General Assembly working with the governor on this particular issue. I have a lot of confidence that if we work together, July 1, 2022, the kinship landscape in Kentucky is going to be improved. And we're counting on you to help make that happen. Eltuan, I believe I am supposed to kick to you and you're going to do the benediction, I believe. So thanks again for joining uh, all of you. Thank you very much, Terry, for those encouraging words and those words of reassurance as well. Um, it is an honor to be able to provide closing remarks or the benediction as Terry referred to it um, for, for us today uh, as we close out. Um, just a few ideas that I like to highlight and elevate that came uh, across my notepad today. Um, I think it's practical uh, in, in this practice to, to um, try to support families in a way uh, to begin with that keeps the child in the natural home as best as we can. Now we know that that's not always an option, so I remain unbiased um, and, and support um, kinship care where there's still supports needed uh, as well uh, like learning the family dynamic or having a support person uh, with lived experience or not uh, for the youth in the, the entire family. Um, we understand that reunification is important, whether that's with the biological parents or as long as we're keeping the child in the family, we're doing our best to 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 help that child not deal with so much developmentally. Um, the, the, the huge highlight in, in, in a lot about this work currently is the idea that we need to elevate youth voices um, and the importance of elevating and practicing youth voice in action and what that looks like and how organizations and uh, DCBS might be able to say, hey, this is how we are providing a more quality practice of care uh, for our young people. Um, so that call to action that I wanna leave everyone with today is to reach out to your state representative and senators. Uh, January 2022 is our budget hearing so we want to make sure that we elevate youth voices um, in, in all arenas, um, in all spaces, um, 
in order to, to do the work and get the work done that we want uh, to accomplish the goals that we have set out to accomplish for our youth and young people uh, and kinships, uh, kinship families as well. I want to thank you, Representative Joni, for, for, for joining me and giving, giving your expert advice and, and, and a lot of your love to this process as well. Um, we, as you said, we, we go back, uh, way back, uh, and I, I have a lot of uh, love for you. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Marta, uh, Ms. Miranda, uh, you've been also an extremely important person in my life. Um, and I want to thank you for, for your dedication and hard work here, Terry Brooks, for your insights and KYA support, our moderators today and everyone who is here in and everyone who is here and present as we look to improve lives for youth across the state of Kentucky. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alswan. And thank you all for hanging in and being part of this robust conversation. Keep up the great work and you'll see some emails from us um, as a follow-up. Please enjoy the rest of your day. Go get some lunch, stretch your legs.